Okay. You know what, I'm going to leave that mic test up on my channel after all for future reference, and <laughs> we're going to record this and see how it goes. So, I actually read this first portion of Fader's Waft from Rialto the Marvelous by Jack Vance last week, but when I went in and listened to my own recording, it turned out that my mic gain had been turned up for some reason. It was pretty bad, <laughs> so I just deleted it altogether, and we're going to give it another shot today. Um, and hopefully the same thing doesn't happen, and if it does, then I'll have to read it again. I think moving forward, I'm going to aim to continue Fritz Lieber's Fafard and the Grey Mauser stories on Sunday, and then I will continue reading Fader's Waft on Mondays. Um, Sundays can be a little touch and go for me, so that's not always going to be a guarantee that, you know, all told. But... Anyway, in a great mood tonight, because I just landed a new job, so that's fucking exciting. Um, yeah, give me like a minute and we'll get started around the two minute mark on Fader's Waft. Okay, so let's see. Before we get started on Fader's Waft, there's sort of an introduction to the Rialto the Marvelous Stories by Vance. Um, and I'm going to go through it. it. It's a bit of a list. It's a long list of all the various magicians' names. And I like to read it simply because they're so fanciful. Um, but feel free to skip. It's not, like, that important, really. It sort of delineates the idea behind this loose gathering of dandy and bizarre magicians who work in concert and maintain a, a sort of constitution among themselves. <clears throat> All right, this is a foreword. There's um, three, I believe, three or four Rialto the Marvelous stories, and I'm skipping the first one, which is named The Mirth. Because I'm not particularly fond of it, it's not really my favorite in the series, and I think it's very skippable. Um, and you won't really lose anything by skipping it, uh, in terms of like understanding context and story. So yeah, let's get down to business. Forward. These are tales of the 21st Aeon, when Earth is old and the sun is about to go out. An Ascolace and all merry lands to the west of the Falling Wall live a group of magicians who have formed an association the better to protect their interests. Their number fluctuates, but at this time they are Ildefons, the Preceptor, Rialto, the Marvelous, Perchance, short and burly, notorious for his truculent disposition, Herarch, the Harbinger, precise and somewhat severe, Shrew, a diabolist whose witticisms mystify his associates and sometimes disturbs their sleep of nights. Gilgad, a small man with large gray eyes and a round gray face, always attired in rose-red garments. His hands are clammy, cold, and damp. His touch is avoided by all. Vermulian, the dreamwalker, a person peculiarly tall and thin, with a stately stride. Mewn, the mage, who speaks minimally and manages a household of four spouses. Zillifant, robust of body, with long brown hair and a flowing beard. Darvilk, the meanther, who, for inscrutable purposes, affects a black domino. <laughs> kind of like tuxedo mask, I guess. Uh, Perdustin, a slight blonde person without intimates who enjoys secrecy and mystery and refuses to reveal his place of abode. Ow of the Opals, Saturnine, with a pointed black beard and a caustic manner. 
Eshmiel, who, with a delight almost childish in its purity, uses a bizarre semblance, half white and half black. Barbanicos, who is short and squat with a great puff of white hair. Haze of weary water, a hot-eyed wisp with green skin and orange willow leaves for hair. Panderlo, a collector of rare and wonderful artifacts from all of the accessible dimensions. Byzant the Necrope, who apparently has no description, just Byzant the Necrope. His name speaks for itself. <laughs> Dulce Lolo, whose semblance is that of a portly epicure. Chamast, morose of mood, an avowed ascetic, whose distrust of the female race runs so deep that he will allow only male insects into the precincts of his manse. Wow, a giga incel. Tooch, who seldom speaks with his mouth, but uses an unusual sleight of... Uh, I'm sorry, but uses an unusual sleight to flick words from his fingertips. As an elder of the hub, he has been allowed the control of his private infinity. Zahulik Kuntz, whose iron fingernails and toenails are engraved with curious signs. Nahorazin, a savant of old Romarth. Zanzel Melanchthonis, and finally, Hachimankur, myself, whose vanities and airs surpass even those of Rialto. <laughs> Magic is a practical science, or, more properly, a craft, since emphasis is placed primarily upon utility rather than basic understanding. This is only a general statement, since in a field of such profound scope, every practitioner will have his individual style, and, during the glorious times of Grand Mothalim, many of the magician philosophers tried to grasp the principles which governed the field. In the end, these investigators, who included the greatest names in sorcery, learned only enough to realize that full and comprehensive knowledge was impossible. In the first place, a desired effect might be achieved through any number of modes, any of which represented a lifetime of study, each deriving its force from a different coercive environment. The great magicians of Grand Mothalim were sufficiently supple that they perceived the limits of human understanding and spent most of their efforts dealing with practical problems, searching for abstract principles only when all else failed. For this reason, magic retains its distinctly human flavor, even though the activating agents are never human. A casual glance into one of the basic catalogs emphasizes this human orientation. The nomenclature has a quaint and archaic flavor. Looking into, for instance, Chapter 4 of Killaclaw's Primer of Practical Magic, Interpersonal Effectuations, one notices... Indeed, uh, <clears throat> indicted in bright purple ink such terminology as and here we have a list of spells Zarfagio's physical malapsy Arnholt's sequestrious digitalia Lutar brass noses twelvefold bounty the spell of forlorn insistment Tinkler's old fashioned Froust Clambard's reign of long nerves the green and purple postponement of joy. Hangwire's triumphs of discomfort. Aluguiler's dismal itch. Kulip's nasal enhancement. And finally, Rattle's pervasion of the incorrect chord. A spell, in essence, corresponds to a code, or set of instructions, inserted into the sensorium of an entity which is able, and not unwilling, to alter the environment in accordance with the message conveyed by the spell. These entities are not necessarily intelligent or even sentient, and their conduct, from the Tyro's point of view, is unpredictable, capricious, and dangerous. The most pliable and cooperative of these creatures range from the lowly and frail elementals through the sandestins. More fractious entities are known by the Temukin as Daihak, which include, quote, demons and gods. A magician's power derives from the abilities of the entities he is able to control. Every magician of consequence employs one or more sandestins. A few arch-magicians of Grand Mothalem dared to employ the force of lesser diehawks. 
to recite or even to list the names of these magicians is to evoke wonder and awe. Their names tingle with power. Some of Grand Mothlam's most notable and dramatic were Fandal the Great, Amberlin the First, and of course Amberlin the Second, Dibarcus Maior, who studied under Fandal, Archmage Mel Lelau, he lived in a palace carved from a single moonstone, the Vapurials, the Green and Purple College, Zing Chin, the Encyclopedist, Chiral of Porphyrinkos, Calanctus, the Calm, and Lorio, the Sorceress. The magicians of the 21st Aeon were, in comparison, a disparate and uncertain group, lacking both grandeur and consistency. And that's where our forward ends. I'm going to take like a 30 second break here to drink some beer. Okay, well, really, it took 10 seconds. But anyway, I'm drinking a wonderful Fuji apple sour. <clears throat> All right, on to Fader's Waft in earnest. Chapter 1. By day, the sun cast a wan, maroon gloom across the land. By night, all was dark and still, with only a few pale stars to post the old constellations. Time went at a languid pace, without purpose or urgency, and folk made few long-range plans. Grand Mothalum was three aeons gone. The great masters of magic were extinct, each having suffered a more or less undignified demise. The, <clears throat> through the treachery of a trusted confidant, or during an amorous befuddlement, or by the machinations of a secret cabal, or through some unexpected and horrifying disaster. The magicians of this, the 21st Aeon, for the most part resided in the quiet river valleys of Almeri and Ascolace, though a few recluses kept the land of Kutz in the north, or the land of the Falling Wall, or even the steppes of Schwang in the distant east. By reason of special factors, which lie beyond the scope of this present exposition, the magicians of the day were a various lot. Gathered in colloquy, they seemed an assembly of rare and wonderful birds, each most mindful of his own plumage. While, on the whole, lacking the flamboyant magnificence of Grand Mothalum, they were no less capricious and self-willed, and only after a number of unhappy incidents were they persuaded to regulate themselves by a code of conduct. This code, known as, quote, the Monstrument, or less formally, the Blue Principles, was engraved upon a blue prism, which was housed in a secret place. The association included the most notable magicians of the region. By unanimous acclaim, Ildefons was proclaimed preceptor and invested with large powers. Ildefons resided at Boomergarth, an ancient castle of four towers on the banks of the River Skom. He had been chosen preceptor not only for his dedication to the Blue Principles, but also for his equable temperament, which at times seemed almost bland. His tolerance was proverbial. At one turn he might be found chuckling to the lewd jokes of Dolce Lolo. The next might find him engrossed in the opinions of the ascetic Chamast, whose suspicions of the female sex ran deep. Ildefons ordinarily appeared as a jovial sage with twinkling blue eyes, a bald pate, and a straggling blonde beard, a semblance which tended to engender trust, frequently to private advantage, and the use of the word ingenuous, when applied to Ildefons, was probably incorrect. At this juncture, the magician subscribing to the Blue Principles number 22 Despite the clear advantages of orderly conduct, certain agile intelligences could not resist the thrill of the illicit and played mischievous tricks, on one occasion performing a most serious transgression against the Blue Principles. 
The case involved Rialto, sometimes known as The Marvelous. He resided at Falu, not far from Wilda Water, in a district of low hills and dim forests at the eastern verge of Ascolace. Among his fellows, Rialto, for whatever justification, was considered somewhat supercilious and enjoyed no wide popularity. His natural semblance was that of a proud and distinguished grandee with short black hair, austere features, and a manner of careless ease. Rialto was not without vanity, which, when taken with his aloof manner, often exasperated his fellows. And certain among them pointedly turned away when Rialto appeared at a gathering to Rialto's sublime indifference. Hachiman Kor was one of the few who cultivated Rialto. He had contrived for himself the semblance of a Catharian nature god with bronze curls and exquisite features, flawed, in the opinion of some, by a fulsome richness of mouth and eyes, perhaps a trifle too round and limpid. Motivated, perhaps by envy, at times he seemed almost to emulate Rialto's mannerisms. In Hachiman Kor's original condition, he had formed a number of fidgeting habits. When absorbed in thought, he squinted and pulled at his ears. When perplexed, he scratched vigorously under his arms. Such habits, which he found hard to abandon, marred the careless aplomb toward which he so earnestly worked. He suspected Rialto of smiling at his lapses, which honed the edge of his envy. And so, the mischiefs began. After a banquet at the Hall of Mun, the mage, the magicians prepared to depart. Making their way into the foyer, they took up their cloaks and hats. Rialto, always punctilious in his courtesies, I'm sorry, courtesies, ex hmm, pardon me, that was rude, but I burped. <laughs> Allow me to begin the sentence again. Rialto, always punctilious in his courtesies, extended to Hertiance first his cloak and then his hat. Perchance, whose heavy-featured head rested directly upon his squat shoulders, acknowledged the service with a grunt. Hachimankor, standing nearby, saw his opportunity and cast a spell which enlarged Hertiance's hat by several sizes, so that when the erasable magician clapped the hat on his head, it dropped in back almost to his shoulders, while in front only the bulbous tip of his nose remained visible. Hertiance tore the hat from his head and studied it from all angles, but Hachimankor had removed the spell, and nothing seemed out of order. Once again, Hertiance tried the hat on his head, and now it fit properly. Even then, all might have been ignored had not Hachimankor made a pictorial imprint of the scene, which he subsequently circulated among the magicians and other persons of the local nobility whose good opinion Hertiance wished to cultivate. The picture showed Hertiance with only the red lump of his nose in sight, and Rialto in the background, wearing a smile of cool amusement. Only Rialto failed to retrieve a copy of the picture, and no one thought to mention it to him, least of all Hertiance, whose outrage knew no bounds, and who now could hardly speak calmly when Rialto's name was mentioned. Hachiman Kor was delighted by the success of his prank, any tarnishing of Rialto's repute could only serve to enhance his own. Additionally, he discovered a malicious pleasure in Rialto's discomfiture. Hachiman Kor thereupon initiated a whole series of intrigues, which at last became, for Hachiman Kor, something of an obsession, and his goal became the full and utter humiliation of the proud Rialto. Achiman Kor worked with consummate subtlety, so that Rialto at first noticed nothing. The plots were for the most part paltry, but always carried a sting. Upon learning that Rialto was refurbishing the guest rooms at Falu, Hachiman Kor purloined a prized gem from Ao of the Opals and arranged that it should hang from the drop chain of the commode in the new lavatory at Falu. In due course, Ao learned of the use to which his magnificent two-inch teardrop opal had been put, and his rancor, like that of Hertiance, approached the violence of a shivering fit. 
Despite all, Al was constrained by Article 4 of the Blue Principles, and so kept his resentment within check. On another occasion, during Rialto's experiments with bubbles of luminous plasm, Hachimankor caused such a bubble to settle into a unique Harkasad tree, which Zillifant had imported from Canopus, and thereupon had nurtured by day and by night with intense solicitude. Once within the tree, the plasm exploded, pulverizing the brittle glass foliage and permeating Zillifant's premises with a vile and persistent odor. Zillifant instantly complained to Rialto in a voice croaking and creaking under the weight of anger. Rialto responded with cool logic, citing six definite reasons why none of his plasms were responsible for the damage, and, while expressing regret, refused to make restitution of any sort. Zillifant's convictions were quietly reinforced by Hachimankor, who stated that Rialto had boastfully announced his intention of using the Harkasad tree as a target. Further, said Hachimankor, Rialto went on to say, and here I quote, Zillifant constantly exudes such a personal chife into the air that the stench of the plasm may well be redundant. And so it went. Gilgad owned a pet simiode, of which he was inordinately fond. At twilight, Hachimankor, wearing a black domino, a black cloak, and a black hat identical to the garments worn by Rialto, captured the beast and dragged it away at the end of a chain to Falu. Here, Hachimankor beat the beast well and tied it on a short scope between a pair of chastity plants, which caused the beast an additional affliction. Gilgad, taking information from peasants, followed the trail to Falu. He released the simiode, listened to its howling complaints, then confronted Rialto with the evidence of his guilt. Rialto crisply denied all knowledge of the deed, but Gilgad, waxing passionate, would not be convinced. He cried out, Buddhist identifies you explicitly. He claims that you made terrifying threats, that you declared, I am Rialto, and if you think you have been beaten soundly, wait only until I refresh myself. Is that not an attitude of merciless cruelty? Rialto said, you must decide whom you will believe, me or that repulsive beast. He gave a disdainful bow and, returning into Falu, closed the door. Gilgad cried out a final complaint, then wheeled after Buddhist I'm sorry, then wheeled Buddhist home in a barrow padded with silken cushions. Thereafter, among his detractors, Rialto could confidently include Gilgad. On another occasion, Rialto, acting in all innocence, was played false by the ordinary fluxions of circumstance, and once again became the target of recrimination. Initially, Hachimankor played no part in the affair, but later made large of it to compound its effect. The episode began on a level of pleasant anticipation. The ranking nobleman of the region was Duke Tambasco, a person of impeccable dignity and ancient lineage. Each year, to celebrate the son's gallant efforts to survive, Duke Tambasco sponsored a grand ball at his palace, Quanork. The guest list was most select, and on this occasion included Ildefons, Rialto, and Byzant the Necrope. Ildefons and Byzant met at Boomergarth, and over tots of Ildefons' best hyperglossum, each congratulated the other on his splendid appearance and made lewd wagers as to who would score the most notable triumphs among the beauties at the ball. For the occasion, Ildefons chose to appear as a stalwart young bravo with golden curls falling past his ears, a fine golden mustache, and a manner both hearty and large. To complement the thrust of the image, he wore a suit of green velvet, a dark green and gold sash, and a dashing, wide-brimmed hat with a white plume. 
Byzant, planning with equal care, chose the semblance of a graceful young esthete, sensitive to nuance and vulnerable to the most fugitive breath of beauty. He joined emerald green eyes, copper red ringlets, and a marmoreal complexion into a juxtaposition calculated to excite the ardor of the most beautiful women at the ball. I will seek out the most ravishing of all, he told Ildefons. I will fascinate her with my appearance and captivate her with my soul. She will fall into an amorous swoon, which I will shamelessly exploit. I see but a single flaw in your argument, chuckled Ildefons. When you discover this creature of superb attraction, she will already be on my arm and oblivious to all else. Ildefons, you have always been a braggart in connection with your conquests, cried Byzant. At Quanark we shall judge by performance alone, and then we shall see who is the true adept. So it shall be. After a final tot of the hyperglossum, the two gallants set off to Falu, where, to their astonishment, they found that Rialto had totally forgotten the occasion. Ildefons and Byzant were impatient and would allow Rialto no time to make preparations, so Rialto merely pulled a tasseled cap over his black hair and declared himself ready to depart. Byzant stood back in surprise. But you have made no preparations. You are not arrayed in splendid garments. You have neither laved your feet nor scented your hair. Uh, no matter, said Rialto. I will seclude myself in the shadows and envy you your own successes. At least I shall enjoy the music and the spectacle. Byzant chuckled complacently. No matter, Rialto. It is time that you had some wind taken from your sails. Tonight, Ildefons and I, oh, pardon, Ildefons and I are primed and ready. You will be entitled to watch our superb talents used to absolutely compelling effect. Bison speaks with exact accuracy, declared Ildefons. You have had your share of triumphs. Tonight, you are fated to stand aside and watch while a pair of experts do what is needful to bring the loveliest of the lovely to their knees. If it must be, so it must be, said Rialto. My concern now is for the heartsick victims of your craft. Have you no pity? None, whatever, declared Ildefons. We wage our amorous campaigns with full force. We give no quarter and accept no paroles. Rialto gave his head a rueful shake. A tragedy that I was not reminded of the ball in time. Come now, Rialto, chuckled Byzant. You must take the bad with the good. Whimpering avails nothing. Ildefons cried out, Meanwhile, time advances. Shall we depart? I'm going to take this natural break to uh, take a break in my reading. I will be back in about a minute, minute and a half. In the meantime, I will leave Eindalmadir on for your listening pleasure.
Okay, I'm back. Arriving at Quanark, the three paid their respects to Duke Tambasco and congratulated him upon the magnificence of his arrangements, compliments which the Duke acknowledged with a formal bow, and the three magicians made way for others. For a period, the three wandered here and there, and indeed on this occasion Duke Tambasco had outdone himself. Grandees and their charming ladies crowded the hall and galleries, and at four buffets, choice viands and fine liquors were deployed in profusion. The three magicians at last repaired to the foyer of the great ballroom where, stationing themselves to the side, they took note of the beautiful ladies as they passed, and discussed the merits and distinguishing characteristics of each. In due course, they decided that, while many comely maidens were in evidence, none could match the agonizingly exquisite beauty of the Lady Shonica of Lake Island. Ildefons presently puffed out his fine blonde mustaches and went his way. Byzant also took his leave of Rialto, who went to sit in a shadowed alcove to the side. Ildefons found the first opportunity to exert his expertise. Advancing upon the Lady Shonica, he performed a sweeping salute and offered to escort her through the measures of a, of a pavan. I am profoundly skillful in the execution of this particular dance, he assured her. I, with my bold flourishes, and you, with your gracious beauty, make a notable pair. We shall be the focus of all eyes. Then, after the dance, I will escort you to the buffet. We will take a goblet or two of wine, and you will discover that I am a person of remarkable parts. More than this, I now declare that I am prepared to offer you my fullest esteem. That is most gracious of you, said the Lady Shonica. I am profoundly moved. However, at this juncture, I have no taste for dancing, and I dare drink no more wine for fear of becoming coarse, which would certainly arouse your disapproval. Ildefons performed a punctilious bow, and prepared to assert his charm even more explicitly, but when he looked up, Lady Shonica had already made her departure. Ildefons gave a grunt of annoyance, pulled at his mustaches, and strode off to seek a maiden of more malleable tendency. By chance, the Lady Shonica almost immediately encountered Byzant. To attract her attention, and possibly win her admiration, Byzant addressed her with a quatrain in an archaic language known as Old Niotic, but the Lady Shonica was only startled and bewildered. Byzant smilingly translated the lyric and explained certain irregularities of the Niotic philology. But after all, said Byzant, these concepts need not intrude into the rapport between us. I sense that you feel its warm languor as strongly as I. Perhaps not quite so strongly, said the Lady Shonica, but then I am insensitive to such influences, and, in fact, I feel no rapport whatever. It will come, it will come, Byzant assured her. I own a rare perception in that I can see souls in all their shimmering color. Yours and mine waver in the same noble radiances. Come, let us stroll out on the terrace. I will impart to you a secret. He reached to take her hand. The Lady Shonica, somewhat puzzled by Byzant's effusiveness, drew back. Truly, I do not care to hear secrets upon such short an acquaintance. It is not so much a secret as an impartment, and what, after all, is duration? I have known you no more than half an hour, but already I have composed two lyrics and an ode to your beauty. Come, out on the terrace, away and beyond, into the starlight, under the trees. We shall discard our garments and stride with the wild innocence of sylvan divinities. Lady Shonica drew back still another step. Thank you, 
but I am somewhat self-conscious. Suppose we ran so briskly that we could not find our way back to the palace, and in the morning the peasants found us running naked along the road. What could we tell them? Your proposal lacks appeal. Byzant threw high his arms and, rolling back his eyes, clutched at his red curls, hoping that the Lady Shonika would recognize his agony of spirit and take pity. But she had already slipped away. Byzant went angrily to the buffet, where he drank several goblets of strong wine. A few moments later, the Lady Shonika, passing through the foyer, chanced upon one of her acquaintances, the Lady Dualtimeta. During their conversation, the Lady Shonika chanced to glance into a nearby alcove where Rialto sat alone on a couch of maroon brocade. Is that brocade? I'll have to look that up later. She whispered to the Lady Dualtimeta, Look yonder into the alcove. Who is that who sits so quietly alone? The Lady Dualtimeta turned her head to look. I have heard his name. It is Rialto, and sometimes Rialto the Marvelous. Do you think him elegant? I myself find him austere and even daunting. <laughs> Truly, surely not daunting. Is he not just a man? Naturally. But why does he sit apart as if he disdained everyone at Quanorg? Everyone, mused the Lady Shonika, as if to herself. The Lady Dualtimeta moved away. My dear, excuse me. Now I must hurry. I have an important part in the pageant. She went her way. The Lady Shonika hesitated, then, smiling as if at some private amusement, went slowly to the alcove. Sir, may I join you here, in the shadows? Rialto rose to his feet. Lady Shonika, you are well aware that you may join me whenever you wish. Thank you. She seated herself on the couch, and Rialto resumed his own place. Still smiling, her secret half-smile, she asked, Do you wonder why I came to sit with you? The question had not occurred to me, Rialto considered a moment. I might guess that you intend to meet a friend in the foyer, and here is a convenient place to wait. That is a genteel reply, said the Lady Shonika. In sheer truth, I wonder why a person such as yourself sits aloof in the shadows. Have you been dazed by tragic news? Are you disdainful of all others at Quanork and their pitiful attempts to put forward an appealing image? Rialto smiled his own wry half-smile. I have suffered no tragic shocks. As for the appealing image of the Lady Shonika, it is enhanced by a luminous intelligence of equal charm. Then, you have arranged a rendezvous of your own? None whatever. Still, you sit alone and speak to no one. My motives are complex. What of yours? You sit here in the shadows as well. Lady Shonika laughed. I ride like a feather on wafts of caprice. Perhaps I am piqued by your restraint, or distance, or indifference, or whatever it may be. Every other gallant has dropped upon me like a vulture on a corpse. She turned him a sidelong glance. Your conduct, therefore, becomes provocative. And now you have the truth. Rialto was silent a moment and said, There are many exchanges to be made between us, if our acquaintance is to persist. The Lady Shonika made a flippant gesture. I have no strong objections. Rialto looked across the foyer. I might then suggest that we discover a place where we can converse with greater privacy. We sit here like birds on a fence. A solution is at hand, said the Lady Shonika. The Duke has allowed me a suite of apartments for the duration of my visit. I will order in a collation and a bottle or two of mayonnaise, and we will continue our talk in dignity and seclusion. The proposal is flawless, said Rialto. He rose and, taking the Lady Shonika's hands, drew her to her feet. Do I still seem as if dazed by tragic news? No, but let me ask you this. 
Why are you known as Rialto the Marvelous? It seems to be an old joke, said Rialto. I have never been able to trace the source. As the two walked arm in arm along the main gallery, they passed Ildefons and Byzant standing disconsolately under a marble statue. Rialto accorded them a polite nod and made a secret sign of more complicated significance to the effect that they might feel free to return home without him. The Lady Shanika, pressing close to his side, giggled. What a pair of unlikely comrades! The first a roisterer with mustaches a foot long, the second a poet with the eyes of a sick lizard. Do you know them? Only slightly. In any case, it is you who interests me and all your warm sensitivities, which to my delight you are allowing me to share. The Lady Shanika pressed even more closely against him. I began to suspect the source of your sobriquet. Ildefons and Byzant, biting their lips in vexation, returned to the foyer, where Ildefons finally made the acquaintance of a portly matron wearing a lace cap and smelling strongly of musk. She took Ildefons to the ballroom, where they danced three gallops, a triple polka, and a kind of strutting cakewalk, where Ildefons, in order to dance correctly, was obliged to raise one leg high in the air, jerk his elbows, throw back his head, then repeat the evolution with all briskness using the other leg. As for Byzant, Duke Tambasco introduced him to a tall poetess with coarse yellow hair worn in loose, lank strands. Thinking to recognize a temperament similar to her own, she took him into the garden where, behind a clump of hydrangeas, she recited an ode of twenty-nine stanzas. Eventually, both Ildefons and Byzant won free, but now the night was waning and the ball was at an end. In sour spirits, they returned to their domiciles, and each, through some illogical transfer of emotion, blamed Rialto for his lack of success. All right, that's the end of chapter one, so I think I'm going to call it a night there. So like I said, um, I'm going to try and do um, Ill Met and Lankmar by Fritz Lieber on Sundays and continue Rialto the Marvelous on Mondays. Uh, if you're able to listen in today, then thanks for hanging out. And if you're listening after the fact, then thanks for that too. <laughs> uh, feel free to check me out on YouTube. It's the same name as on Twitch, and uh, I'm just uploading VODs there. Um, of stories I read previously before they fall off the page. Um, but yeah, thanks for hanging out, and I hope you enjoyed uh, this first chapter of Rialto the Marvelous by Jack Vance, and uh, I hope to see you next week. Take it easy. <laughs>